Hello and welcome to the Sense Making in a Changing World podcast. I'm Moray Gamble. Join me each week in conversation with leading ecological thinkers, activists, authors, designers, and practitioners to explore what now, what is the kind of thinking we need to navigate a positive and regenerative way forward, to myceliate possibilities, to explore what a thriving one planet way of life could look like. My guests offer voices of clarity and common sense. The Sense Making a Changing World podcast is a project of the Permaculture Education Institute. We teach permaculture design, teaching and livelihood skills online to people on six continents who in turn localise and enrich it and find appropriate ways to apply the planet care ethics of earth care, people care and fair share wherever they are. In this episode, I'm speaking with the fabulous duo Emily and Joshua Prieto, creators and directors of Seeds of Down podcasters and regenerative business coaches. In this, ep- in this episode, I'm speaking with the fabulous duo Emily and Joshua Prieto, creators and directors of Seeds of Dow, podcasters and regenerative business coaches. They've combined their creative and business skills to support regenerative permaculture businesses to thrive through programs like their, regener- like their Regenpreneur Think Tank, Their goal is to support entrepreneurs to create solutions that address the root problems we face in society today and to catalyze regenerative economies and permanent cultures, permacultures. And they are an awesome homeschooling family living their best permaculture life. I'm recording this episode from my hand-built solar-powered studio here on beautiful Gubby Gubby country, surrounded by my permaculture design gardens in a permaculture village. Before we jump in, I'd love to invite you to subscribe to the Sense Making a Changing World podcast on your favourite podcast app, and please do leave us a five-star review and a lovely comment. It does indeed help the bots to find our show. All right, well, let's turn now to the conversation with Emily and Joshua. When I last spoke to you, you weren't in Panama. What brings you to Panama? Let's just begin with our with our placemaking. Like, where are you, and and what brought you to Panama? It's quite. I've never actually spoken to anyone on this podcast before calling in from Panama. <laughs> yeah, it's a wonderful place. So we came here. There was a an opportunity for us to work with a fellow who had a permaculture farm. So it was this opportunity for us to kind of get out of our space, go explore something new. Um, I actually majored in Latin American studies and then never used my Spanish. I was having kids and everything. And like, oh, that would be cool because I already you know, know how to speak and I love the culture and everything. And so it just kind of seemed like this cosmic opportunity to go check it out and the opportunity at the farm, uh, we were there for about nine months, didn't quite work out, but we really fell in love with, with the people here. They're just the nicest in the world. And kind of all of our family was kind of settling into this vibe. And so we decided to hang around and try to continue our work in regeneration um, here, which really, really needs it. Um, there's a lot of challenges that that Panama faces here. And so we've really fallen in love with the area and the people. And now we're working on kind of establishing ourselves here and continuing the conversation of regeneration because it's really not in the conversation here. Both of you have been uh, the co-creators of Seeds of Tau. Do you want to just tell us a little bit what that is? Because it's not just the podcast. There's so much more to it than the podcast, as well as the podcast. So, um, and, and the focus being all around regenerative entrepreneurship why why focus on that because i know you have a permaculture background and uh, and a sort mm-hmm. of a, like business background as well i understand why is it that you feel like this is that key part of the picture it, it starts off because we, we all can't be farmers for one thing and we tried being the off-grid farmer for a little while uh, and and so for us uh it it made sense to work in that field because we felt like we could make the the biggest impact. My degree is in entrepreneurship. I got the degree because I was, I honestly always wanted to start my own business for impact reasons, right? I wanted to create change to the business that I was uh, creating. And I didn't know any of those other things in the the world, like permaculture, regeneration, regenerative agriculture. I knew sustainability and I was a big advocate for sustainability. Um, But when I started getting into entrepreneurship, my reason was to to create an impact business. 
we played around in so many different fields uh, to, to get to where, where we are. Emily grew up in a space where she, on a hobby farm, essentially, growing up with, with her dad, and got to raise uh, animals and, and grow things, and, and she really enjoyed that. And so we actually, first, we tried the, the farming. Uh, we went and bought some land in Montana. And we, we actually failed miserably at that. So. Yeah, with two little kids, like <laughs> renovating this old, old Airstream trailer and like heading into the sunset. Uh-huh. It was an adventure, but it was tough. Uh-huh. You really uh-huh. picked it like a whole lot of things all at once. Renovation, uh-huh. young kids, and trying to start farming. Yeah, that's uh-huh. Uh-huh. In Montana, where the winters are most of the year. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It was wild. It- but it was a good like trial of fire it was a good betterment process for us it was we, we yeah. were able to see some things we needed to change within ourselves and become better people and become more united through that trial of fire but i think what you said we, before is really interesting though like you know you can be totally into permaculture and regenerative processes but you don't actually have to necessarily be the person growing the food we need people mm-hmm. in all of the spectrums and actually the role that you're playing now <laughs> is something that I think is absolutely critical to shift it out from just being necessarily like a a hobby or something you do on the side to something that we put front and centre. How do we live our lives and create our work and support ourselves and our communities and our families through regenerative practices? And what does that look like? Let's like level up this and um, bring ourselves, bring, bring a whole lot more people into this space as well. And I think there's a sense possibly that, you know, it's it's a really hard thing to do or possibly that um, there's not many opportunities in it. And, you know, one of the things that I'm trying to do a lot through the Permaculture Education Institute is, is to really pull back a lot of the, you know, the layers and just to, you know, mm. see through that lens of possibilities within this space. Like wh- whatever you bring all of your world into this and then you put the lens of regeneration on that. Like, oh, mm-hmm. my gosh, all of a sudden there's this kaleidoscope of opportunity. <laughs> yeah. no, and I a- think that's really the only way that we're going to see more broad scale change because we've been such this like marginal culture, you know, regeneration and permaculture and things like that. But if we're really going to get into the main conversation and really start changing the culture as opposed to screaming at people and shaming them into regeneration, and greener choices, right? If we're really going to create thought change, we need to expand our sphere of influence and entrepreneurs and businesses have a really unique opportunity to do that through their marketing and messaging for good, right? Not to manipulate, but genuinely to share the message and the movement and get people excited about it and give them viable viable solutions so that they can change their habits. But there is a solution there that's easy for them to do that. And if businesses aren't presenting those opportunities, it's going to be harder for the broad, you know, people in general to make those solutions because they don't know what they don't know, or it's too hard because those things aren't available. And so that's why for me, like entrepreneurship is such this cool opportunity and regeneration, because not only are we able to expand our influence like that with whatever we're involved in, you know, there's people doing marine permaculture, there's people doing education for the next generation, you know, there's all these different things. And putting it in an entrepreneurship lens, not only increases our sphere of influence, but it also gets rid of the kind of like the permaculture martyr, right, where people in permaculture were so passionate, so passionate, we find a million ways to volunteer and give and give and give. But if we don't get any like energy back in forms of creating a sustainable lifestyle, we're just going to burn out and then we can't influence anyone. And so it's this really kind of unique thing that that we can be nurtured, we can nurture others and we can really, really expand our voice and amplify our voice. And really shifting our relationship too with 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 money. And it's not to say Mm -hmm. that you can't volunteer. It's not to say that you can't give back. It's like all of that together, but at the same time making sure that you really think about how you can support the whole. Is this kind of focus for you something that you find is you're getting a lot of interest in and is it people are coming because they want to be taking outside of the job and creating their own opportunities so they can be at home with their family or like where are you seeing people coming and asking for help? Like what's what's their motivation and driving force do you think we do a lot of market research a part of my background and a part of Emily's is 
marketing and branding. Uh, we've been creatives. We've been in in the marketing world for so long, and for a while, it was we were helping lots of different businesses that we weren't necessarily proud of. Right? Uh, it was making pretty things to make people look pretty and they get messaging to attract people in that weren't necessarily the best best of businesses. And it's one of the reasons why we started this business because we were I was building a branding agency with a with a friend and. As we started building things, it was hard to find clients that we truly, really wanted to work with, right? Um, and so when we, when I, when I stepped away from that business, there was this: well, can we really focus in on people that are doing really good things, right? We started doing the market research, and what we found is we were really scratching our own niche in the beginning. It's like we want to want to start a business that is focused in on these types of things, right? And is there enough people out there? Is is there uh, people willing to transition from doing things like what we were doing before in their own career and then moving into how can it be more regenerative? How can we use permaculture principles in our business? And we did tons of interviews. Um, and part of our podcast started from that just to do the market research. Uh, it was just to find out like what people are are working towards and what their their needs are and what they are wanting um, to accomplish with their with their business with their lives. And what we, we found, didn't even know if there was that many people interested in this. Is there's tons of people, yeah, <laughs> but there are <laughs> there there is tons of people that are really focused in on they 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 take their PDC they get excited right. But then what happens after you take your PDC? You go back to your your normal life. Right, and most people they don't have jobs in and careers and lives that are focused in on this, and so they get they maybe start to look they they maybe start gardening a different way, or they um, start looking at things differently in their household. But then I we we saw through the market research that people get lost, and we got lost ourselves. Like, how do we make this happen? How do we see our our communities turn into permanent cultures and 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 this this whole idea of of really trying to make uh, you know that solar punk future happen, right? And we saw that come and come again. And it, and it could be someone that's going the traditional agricultural way uh, in permaculture and trying to, and we totally need that. But there is so much need for the person that steps away from from the technology space and moves into uh, to helping businesses trans transform their, their practices in, in, in design. There's so many people that are needed in uh, architecture, in, in clothing industries, and in so many industries that could use that perspective. That, that perspective. lens, like mm -hmm. Morag was saying, yes. putting on whatever their specialty is, whatever their passion is, but putting that lens on. But here's the, the, the kind of dark side, and maybe you can explain this as well, Emily, like uh, those that are practicing permaculture and in and, and region, we have a lot of baggage around the the hurt that that has been done where entrepreneurs it's like trauma exist they deal with a lot of right? trauma uh, and that is you know the capitalist nature of of what what where entrepreneurs have have lived in and it almost limits our ability to work with and work for um, the the current uh, economies mm -hmm. and then uh, help to bring it into a new new economy and. We're not quite sure that we have the answer for that, but we do we do notice it, especially in our market research. But yeah, so we've we've noticed this. I mean, people are so overwhelmed by the problem and it's so bringing them down, right? We're fighting this behemoth of this negative impact all over the world, but they also associate a lot of those negative feelings with kind of the shouting negative aspects of capitalism and money and profit. And they turn all those words into curse words in their mind and they wrap a lot of negative energy around those things. If they're really trying to expand their impact, they can't make money in their business if money is a four-letter word for them. Yeah, you know they can't uh, have their business grow if they believe that profit is a bad thing. It's so we're really one thing we're really trying to do. We don't have the answer, but we're at least trying to open the conversation. Say, hey, how are you being this word? Because it's just like a tool. Profit is like a hammer. It's not inherently good or evil. It depends what you do with it. I'm so trying to open the conversation and uncover the those kind of energy blocks of people and then showing them like, it's okay. You can have a business and you're not evil. 
and you can make a profit and that doesn't make you evil and you can do good things, right? <laughs> exactly. You know, if you if you need to make some money, where are you making it? Like, are you making it going out and doing a job somewhere where you have no control over it or are you going to do it in your own enterprise where you mm-hmm. have complete control over the kind of the mm-hmm. ethics and the choices and decisions that you make? And so, or, you know, where is it that your livelihood's coming from? And I think this is a really key part. How do you apply the principles of permaculture to your regenerative enterprise yourself to support your family and and your permaculture way of life? How does that how does that actually work for you? So many people are curious about how people make permaculture livelihoods. I mean, it's a great question. Yeah. Well, so we all know in the world of regeneration and permaculture, we have these principles. Right. And so what we have done is kind of taken the the patterns and the principles of these topics and applied them to create kind of a regenerative business design. Right. So one of the big things that I always think about is, you know, how we start with zone zero and we work from the inside out. And a lot of entrepreneurs and businesses in general have a really hard time connecting with their their ideal customer, who they're trying to talk to, if they don't do that work from the get-go, you know, starting with why are we doing this? Um, How are we showing up for these people, right? And so if they don't start with that, they can get really schizophrenic in their messaging. So they don't have like a clear, concise voice. And so we start out, um, we have a course that is self-paced, but there's also kind of a mentoring aspect with it because we do do weekly office hours. We basically taken what we used to do as a branding agency through intensive uh, intensives and kind of one-on-one work and turned it into a course where people can go through it at their own pace, but they can also meet with us weekly if they get into, into bumps, right? Or if they have questions. So that. yeah, it's the story seed marketing and messaging course that we've put together. It's in beta mode right now. But it's doing really great things for these entrepreneurs. Who comes in and starts to work with you? Are they people from around the world or are they people more locally? How does that work as well? We're, we're looking at this from a perspective of our, our own growth as an organization as well. But we're learning from our own mistakes as, as slow and simple solutions. We're not going to just go buy some land and pop ourselves on, on, on a, a, a huge plot of land and, and like try, to, did. try to do that again. Because we learned that permaculture principle, right? So the, the slow and small solutions is, this is our, this has been our, been our bread and butter for a very long time is, is consulting and doing marketing and branding work, uh, creating uh, and beautifying and creating story driven uh, messages for entrepreneurs. And so that's largely what Story Seed is, is doing for, for specifically regenerative and permaculture entrepreneurs, right? So that uh, is where, we're, we're starting and, and we, we've worked with, you know, all, all sorts of different uh, nonprofit and for-profit entrepreneurs, right? So a lot of people think that if, if it's a nonprofit, it's not a business. Well, and that there's not an entrepreneur in that. But you know, Morag, that you have nonprofits and you are definitely an entrepreneur within that business, right? Yeah. And that you're taking on risks. So the, the people who we help are those that are willing to take on the risk to create regenerative change through their business, right? And so it could be a number of different types of businesses that you're 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 working in. We have people that are again like nonprofit uh, fully um, and 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 set up that way, where they're more helping communities uh, or they're helping some sense. And it could be local. We also have uh, people that are are more just getting the voice out there. We have someone that just just actually got into Story Seed. That's uh, her business is helping uh, people in the PR sector shake up more on the what do you call that activism, like the policy uh, side, po- policy um, activism for uh, local food availability, healthier food solutions mm-hmm. through the through policy and legislation. But she's actually just realized that she's having she's accidentally bringing in the wrong type of people, people that are more extremist than she wants to be talking to, and that's a messaging issue, right? Mm-hmm. And so we're she's trying to adjust her business so that she can monetize it better through consulting so she can in- increase her influence to get these changes happening. And so she's coming with us to go through Story Seed and, 
and really hone in her message and kind of anchor her back. So she's speaking in the right way to get the right message across and not accidentally bringing in the wrong people. <laughs> yeah. And, it's and we, so and important. Have, yeah, it is. It is. We have, uh, we have uh, a lot of, a lot of people that we work with are friends too. Right. So we, we have a friend who's taken our, our courses as part of our program. That's you may be even familiar because he's in Australia in Melbourne, uh, Ray, right. Uh, he's been on the podcast and he's, he's, he's been engaged in, in it's an entrepreneurial community that we're building as well. Mm-hmm. It's part of what mm-hmm. the, the product and services is we're working together, to solve challenges as uh, regenerative entrepreneurs. And Ray is in helping people learn about soil and, and, and educate farmers about the transition away from um, this, this extractive farming. And so he's in the education area. Uh, we do have people that are uh, starting their their own little farm or eco tourist uh, scenario, uh, so it kind of runs the gamut. It it varies uh, a it lot. Really does. Some of them already have messaging set up, and they realize that they need to get it more tailored. Some people are just starting out, and they have no idea how to reach their client or who their client should even be because they want to help everyone. Mm-hmm. So it just it just really depends. People are starting businesses, growing businesses, scaling businesses, mm-hmm. and no matter what stage you're at your messaging and branding needs to be on point if you want to expand your message and kind of add to the movement. You know, I it's such valuable knowledge and skills to learn and it's so great that you you've got this process for people because I, you know, I I've made all the mistakes as well. I I went through landscape architecture school and I did you know, sustainability education masters and was a food politics lecture. I learned nothing about business. I had no <laughs> idea about business. All my experience of when I came through as a, um, you know, in my early years in permaculture was as a volunteer and setting up community gardens. It was actually through that volunteering process that I learned about how to run a business, like you're saying, like in the not-for-profit sector, how to actually make things work and hold things together. And, and the risk was low then. So I got to take a lot of risks knowing that I wasn't going to lose anything so I could try a whole lot of stuff. And that was a really great learning ground for me. But I had no idea before then. And I do hear that a lot of people saying that, you know, they would feel a lot more confident if they did have these skills because they might be in a job that they don't want to be working in and they've done some kind of permaculture and have these dreams of where they want to go to but sort of have all these mind blocks along the way and so I guess mm-hmm. this idea of really coming down into what the purpose is and and the direction and the storytelling that you're saying what are some of the other tools that you that you share with people to help unlock these possibilities of where people can go a part of what uh, people get when they join story seed or even our, our our free offerings we have a community that uh really each each month we come together and we we meet together as regenerative entrepreneurs and we work through challenging and, and we solve each other's solu- we, we create solutions for each other's challenges. Like today, we're we're going to be talking to typically anywhere from fifteen to twenty uh, entrepreneurs that will get on and we'll, we'll talk through our difficult difficulties and we're we're there to support. More like I'm working through this, this, and this, and I want to accomplish this. What what? Can we do together to to work out this challenge? Yeah, right? Who knows who? Who, who knows, knows who, what yeah. resource I need? So we can all just kind of put our heads together because right. entrepreneurs entrepreneurs have to wear so many hats. You cannot be the master of everything, and so that's the really great thing of this this think tank is everyone can come with their specialties. Everyone's having different challenges, and chances are there's someone else there who can give you advice to get over that hump. Mm-hmm. As art is going through it themselves, so you can work mm-hmm. together with that person. True. Or there's 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 a symbiotic relationship that we found like that almost always you know kind of happens is like this person's need, needing this, this person is is working on this, or they have parts of the problem together, and if you put them together, they, they have a whole problem or, or whole solution. Mm-hmm. Um, it's and, a great opportunity for collaboration between entrepreneurs. Yeah. And and there's there's always so, so like the the thing we like like to to bring to that room is like we know nothing right and let's bring a beginner's mind and that's one of the reasons why we named this company Seeds of Dow. It's Dow is way we're seeding ways um, for a regenerative future or through the through the businesses. And another term for an early stage business is a seed, 
but we're trying to take that in a different perspective rather than the capitalist. Like these are seeds to to a new way, right? If if we start these types of businesses, the regenerative businesses. Mm-hmm. So we have this community, and that's a huge tool for entrepreneurs as well. Yeah, and I love too the way that it's that it is that collaboration, it is in that relationship, and it's not like anyone's going to take the idea because you're all working on slightly different things, but together <laughs> you can help to solve each other's problems and and you know uplift everyone. And there's something about what you were saying before too that reminded me why I love doing this so much is because it's it's so creative and responsive and there's always something new going on and there's always something to solve or something to connect or you know some story to tell or and it's a it's a really creative process being an entrepreneur uh-huh, yeah. and I yeah. you know often you sort of think oh running a if you talk about as running a business Sometimes it feels like a little bit sluggish, you know, like you've got a slow way of running the business. I'm in the business. But when you think about being an entrepreneur and like how would you describe the process for yourselves? Like do you feel that creativeness in it, that responsiveness in it? Like what? how would you describe that creative process for you? I love creating systems and businesses. It's working on the invisible systems. Like so and we can design just like a, a permaculture land design. We've done a few different, and especially Emily has done a few different land designs, and we still use those same same the same principles to, to design in our on our own business. Like it's a lot about design. It's about designing invisible structures. After a little while, you're you and you start bringing people into your business, you're designing a community. And you're designing people that are are working with you and, and work for you. Um, and you got to understand that if you don't design those systems intentionally, they're going to be de- designed uh, unconsciously, right? And that's what a lot of businesses are doing these days. They're designing things to make profit because they 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 need or want uh, want money, uh, and but they're doing it in a way that is not necessarily very consciously designed to see how they're impacting the world around them. And so it's our job as as people that understand that perspective to design intentionally. And so it's a design process. Yeah, I really think that entrepreneurship kind of scratches everyone's creative itch. Like Josh's, his superpower is systems. Like he's an amazing system designer. He can see it from the eagle eye and he totally loves creating new systems. I hate creating systems. That is not my superpower. However, I I do all the, the visual things with our business, all the graphic design, all the editing, all, all of that stuff. And that scratches my itch. I love the visual side of branding and the visual psychological link with branding. And so that's kind of what I bring to the table. And I love to work in that space. And so even though, like I said before, entrepreneurs wear many hats and not all of all of those hats are super comfortable or you love to do them, there's usually at least one like good role that you really just just love to step into that space. Yeah. And I think that it's an it's an interesting profession, shall I say, because there's so many different ways that you can amplify your personal strengths and your personal talents and your your just your passions. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. I wonder too, I've I I've noticed in my my business how it keeps changing and evolving around my family. You know, mm. so the kind of programs that I ran when my kids were, you know, knee high to a grasshopper are different from the kind of programs that I run now. And I wonder how your you've noticed your business design change as your children have grown, or you know, the fact that you're you moved country and it's still possible to run your business. So how much does your your family life be a design? factor in your business design one thing that i've always wanted and have dreamed about is like having my work life match my my family life and and it become very much in the same because i i don't feel like we have any time on this earth to to not work on things that we are truly passionate about truly care about and truly move our family and household forward and and our communities forward and so for us it, it's it's very intentional that we've designed our business to be a part of our our family and what we do and how we we operate in the world and um and be there as much as we can in in ways that matter most for our children we have four little ones between the ages of 
five, and, five ten. and ten. Yeah. Uh, and and so it gets really it can get really chaotic trying to trying to build a business together. But it, it's also we know that we're doing this all together, and our children understand what we're doing, and they 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 get excited when when uh, we say, "Oh, someone someone else joined the course today." Uh, and and that you know, and we have like a little worm farm together. We, we always have like some little side business that we're we're doing together, right? Mm-hmm. So so it, we incorporate our our business and our entrepreneurial endeavors. We're producing a yield, and we're doing that in, together, right? Yeah. Beautiful. Um, yeah. So on the mom end, <laughs> because we do have four kids in five years. Like it was an army very quick. Yes. <laughs> and and so I mean, when they were little, this is kind of before seeds of doubt, when we had babies and stuff, and we were doing a lot of the kind of mental growth, the mental transitions towards regeneration, towards permaculture, going through all of that. Um, but one big thing that that just is unique to our family, because we're getting to the point where our kids are a little bit older. We don't have toddlers. We have kids who can make their own snacks. We have, you know, we don't have to help go to the bathroom or anything. You know, we're kind of beyond those days. Hallelujah. <laughs> and <laughs> And so we're at a point now, and we've actually recently been doing a a transition to unschooling, which I'm so excited to go to your masterclass and hear about the unschooling thing. I'm so excited. Um, So we're in this unschooling space with our kids, where we're allowing them space to find their passion and their drives. And so it's actually kind of a recent transition for us because I've been mostly with the kids and Josh has been mostly working. Right. And then there's things that I have to do, but mostly I'm with the kids. But lately we've just in our family dynamic have swapped where Josh is working three days a week, like 12 hour days, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then I'm working Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Right. And doing those full days. But then we always have a parent with the kids. Right. And it it's we're like, why didn't we do this earlier? Like, this is an amazing schedule. Someone's always with the kids. You have a break between work days. Like, it's brilliant. But we really did need to wait till our kids kind of got to this space, yeah. right? Um, I think this kind of schedule would have been possible back in the States. Like, the changing country doesn't necessarily affect that, but it definitely affects the types of things that our kids are learning. I mean, it, it affects our daily schedule. Every single day, we're really lucky to live literally right next to a park where all the kids go out and play. And so after 5.30 till 7, our kids are just out there learning Spanish. Right. By immersion. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. And learning to communicate. And, and so it's it's changed a lot of our family dynamic. I don't think, well, but with the business, we've really seen coming here, we've seen that Panama being this really amazing opportunity to set up this like bioregional hub which is something that we're working on creating a space where we can have bioregional education. That's, which is an issue with permaculture, right? Like you can't go learn permaculture across the world in a totally different environment and apply ev- everything to where you're at. Right. I mean, things are the same, but plants change everything. And so coming to Panama has helped us kind of open this new avenue that we're working on with our business. We, we saw a really strong need for entrepreneurs, um, working together on, on similar challenges and problems and filling the, like that, that need of, okay, I'm working on this. Uh, I'm creating organic fertilizers and, and uh, pesticides, right? That's my business over here. And, and we're doing it in a very regenerative way. We also have food growing, but that's our main cash crop, right? Is that, and over here, this person is needing that type of stuff, but can also give some of their waste, additional waste uh, over to this person that's, that's doing this, uh, compost business or, you know, and so there's these, these bioregional uh, hubs that we can see and even culturally, like how, how can we get past some of these barriers? We could do that together, right? Uh, with, with the government or with uh, uh, local uh, thoughts and, and, and culture that, that is stagnant in, in some areas that like my, uh, almost everybody in this, this, this community here that we're in is, spraying their, their lawn in for bugs and stuff because yeah. there's a lot of bugs in Panama. There's a lot right? of bugs in Panama. And and so people don't like like bugs necessarily in their in their houses and whatnot. But we smell that chemical almost it's weekly, really bad. at least once, right? Like really strong. We're like, oh who sprayed today? You know? Mm. Uh and and so but those types of things together entrepreneurs, if they're working on something uh, like that, we can we can create change 
in a stronger way in in our in our bioregion. Yeah, it's like by an opportunity for bioregional collaboration, mm-hmm. right? Which is so important. So we right now we're still building community to do that to build. So it's it's a growth that we're working towards. In, in yeah, yeah, that sounds incredible. So I I wondered too about about your move to to Panama. How does it feel to to relocate your business? Is there ways that it's affected your business, or because you are you know a lot of a lot of people I speak to would like to move to different places, but get a little bit worried about you know shifting there. How have you found? shifting like you know one on a community level um two you know with the kids finding new friends and new patterns and and three you know disrupting your business pattern or is it something that is sort of you've landed and then something new has emerged like what is that sort of transition for you from from one country to another and how are you finding that from a business perspective like i said we, we try to keep those uh really close we came here on an opportunity to possibly have ownership in a farm that was designed permaculture, but didn't they didn't have enough time. To it. So we we pivoted because we did a pivot in our business because we were focusing on entrepreneurial education for regenerative entrepreneurs um, in a more international realm, right? So we were focusing, we were in the office most of the time. Um, you know, we we the only thing that we were doing in a sense in the outdoors is like our own little garden, right? And, and maintaining our garden. And that was was something that I didn't enjoy as much because I was the one working on the business mostly. And so I was there in front of a screen all day, most of the time. Right. Um, so that, that's one thing I think in our transition, that's been truly beneficial is like, we are more focused now in our community because of this uh, transition. Um, and we're more mostly forced, forced into it in a, in a way because we're trying to grow. But there's so when you, when you, Get a, get close to those edges. There's so much opportunity for growth in our lives, right? There's those boundaries where we're uncomfortable, right? And that works. It's a permaculture principle. We're using value those edges, right? Well, that's in our own lives. Like, step up against those edges, and if you go out and you do something new, you're going to grow so much, and you're going to move into areas that you never thought you would. Mm-hmm. And we took an opportunity to go live on a farm, and it didn't work out. Um, it, but what it offered us was an opportunity of growth that stepped us into a whole new mm-hmm. uh, way of doing our business. And we wouldn't have had that mental expansion had we not left and basically started from scratch mentally, Yeah, mm-hmm. which we feel like the our crazy move to Montana kind of prepared us for moving <laughs> somewhere where we don't know anyone. <laughs> this is even more so because I was the only one who spoke Spanish and even still it had been, you know, 11 years since I was in school speaking Spanish. Yeah. I had to really learn over. Um, But from the family perspective, it was really tough. I mean, our kids were very rooted in Utah. We had an amazing homeschooling community, lots of friends. You know, we were sad to leave. But at the same time, literally, like, we left in October. But in January, before we even knew about this opportunity, I put on my vision board, we're going to move out of the country. And I didn't even know where. And it totally happened. And so like, we knew this is something that we really wanted to do. Slowly but surely, the kids got excited. It took them a while here, but we were so, our church is also here. And so we were, luckily we had that kind of instant community and we made instant friends. We were always joking around how we have, I mean, we love our friends from Utah, but we have also so many amazing friends here that is just, is just fantastic. And the community here, I mean, in Latin America, really, like, they just welcome you with open arms. And everyone really does genuinely know their neighbor here. <laughs> like, there's so much more of an instant community that I than compared to how I felt in the States. Like, you didn't necessarily know your neighbor and you didn't want to impose and everything. And here, you know, the doors are more open. People are, you know, there's just more mixing, I feel, which has really helped us to feel welcome. Um the kids recently, we just moved to a different part in Panama so that we are starting over a little bit with community. Um, but the kids, I feel like are having so much growth that they wouldn't have been able to have. We've Josh and I have talked about this before. Like we want our kids to feel like they can move anywhere, even if they don't speak the language and they can be okay and they can start over. And we've included the kids in our decisions in our conversations about the difficulties that we're going to face. And I think it's really 
can it, it helps them to be stronger individuals and have more faith in themselves. The mm-hmm. kids can now navigate airports. They can deal with long bus rides to other countries and, and understand what's happening at the border and all these skills that aren't, you know, school taught skills or whatever, but it allows them to have so much more personal power and freedom. And so we feel that way. We feel more power and freedom with our ability to travel and interact with different cultures this way. And the kids feel that too. So it's been an amazing opportunity. Yeah. And I highly yeah. recommend it for everyone. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that I what you just described there, I mean, the learning, every single step along the way, the learning that's taking place in all of those experiences mm-hmm. when everything's fresh and new. You know, you imagine... Um, you know, just going to school every day and this, it is kind of like becomes quite the same and, and the, the, the learning that happens sort of diminishes day by day. I think when you have these fresh new experiences, you are just like an absolute sponge. And, I, you know, mm-hmm. I love the way you're talking about, you know, just the kids are out there in the park learning Spanish. You know, it would, how many years would it take you going to school classes to get that level of proficiency? You'd probably yeah. never get it by the time you finished high school even, you know, just <laughs> the way you'd, if you're thrown into that. And I think the other thing that's really wonderful um, is is how you involve your children too in talking about your business and what you do. You know, I'm I'm wearing this shirt at the moment. I don't know if you can see it. My, let's see if I can turn my, my my son, oh, um, yeah, yeah. my 14-year-old son, so I have a 16-year-old daughter, a 14, oh, sorry, he's just turned 15, um, a 15-year-old <laughs> son and a 9-year-old son. And the middle one is really interested in business. And, uh, mm. and he says, they don't talk about it at school. Like, they don't, t- don't tell us anything. And and he says, I really want to know what's going on. And and he got frustrated at one point. He says, you never tell me anything. You just sort of tell me the edges of it. And and I realised he wanted to know the nitty-gritty nuts and bolts, you know, when there was a campaign on, you know, how much we earned, how that worked, what was the strategies that we used in all the different, you know, communications, the writing. And, and so he's actually started to get really involved. And I always run everything past him. I've just written this email letter. What do you think about it? And he wouldn't be able to write it, but he can edit it and think it through and tell me his his feedback on that. Or I'll, I'll have done a new website design and he'll look over it and he say, you know, I reckon you should. And so just together we're talking it through. And then so he decided that he wanted to start up a merch store attached to my YouTube channel. And I said, okay, all right, that can be yeah. cool. <laughs> you design them and we'll put them up there. You know, you've got the platform of the YouTube channel, but you can manage all that side of things. And so he he's found these shirts are uh, organic, uh, fair trade cotton, including recycled co- cotton. And inside there's a little return QR code that, you know, if you want to return it when you finish using it, they'll recycle it back in and, and so he wow. did the research on that and he's done the design awesome. and and um and so that's his his business startup and I think fantastic you know like it wasn't like going to business school but just by being involved in this and it's a little bit I'm thinking about because as you were saying just this immersion process with our children if we involve them in the decision making if we talk to them about it and this is like a really big part of the unschooling isn't it it's like mm-hmm. yes what yeah. is it that that child that particular child shows so much passion and interest in and find a way to weave that into your daily conversation <laughs> my little one he's he's all about the stories in the theater and you know so we're mm. history we're always talking about history and and it's just wonderful you know and i th- I absolutely love the the homeschooling, unschooling type of way of being, and and um, yeah. So, what made you decide to to homeschool your children? What was your motivation? Do you think from the beginning? <laughs> um, Josh <laughs> <laughs> totally pressured me into it. <laughs> I totally did. I totally. I so the context is, uh, I was working for a reading curriculum company, and they are an amazing company, Reading Horizons. They help uh, struggling readers is their focus, and they teach an Orton Gillingham method. So it's like made for a struggling reader to work through, and it, it's really for every re- reader that uh, to re- read in a sequential way. And I was really passionate about what they were doing, but I was we were I was in, in cells selling to uh, schools and institutions, right? And what I noticed is there's so much waste in the education industry in the states. I'm sure it's a, the same in other countries as well, uh, where they would buy 
millions of dollars of curriculum for reading curriculum to help their their district. And then they would drop it a year later, like not even implement it because they would get more money and they would have to spend that too. And they would spend it on another curriculum. I was like, what? This is crazy. And I got so dis disenchanted with, with that, that my cells started dropping and uh, my, my, the president saw that and he's like, do you know what? You are really passionate about this. And I, I think you would maybe work better in this little area over here. And it was working with the homeschoolers. And the, the, the so you fell in love with the homeschool. So, right? <laughs> so I, I I started what is this homeschool thing? I I had no clue about it. I had struggled. I, I'm dyslexic myself, right? I struggled in school. And and so it was like there is so many different ways that you can teach your children. And we we saw um, you know, there was Charlotte Mason, there was um Waldorf, Waldorf there was unschooling, there was all of these these amazing things. And this is what I want our kids to do. And we hadn't we had a we had a newborn at the time. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa. <laughs> and, and I'm like, Emily, we should homeschool. And of course, I'm I'm in a career uh, at, at a at a um, uh, at a and we're a young couple and 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 I'm like, we should homeschool. But that would totally be on her at that point. Yeah. Right. And <laughs> I am not dyslexic. I did amazing in the school system. <laughs> I had no intentions to homeschool at all. I'm like, why? The school system's fine. But then he started showing me things, and then I started actually looking into the school systems and being come, becoming disenchanted myself. Meanwhile, remember our kid was really little, but our kids are really close together. So when, by the time our oldest was one and a half, we had number two, right? Like it was boom, 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 boom. But our oldest is this giant brain sponge, right? So he was three and he was if he was not like intentionally learning somehow, he would just be nuts. Like, he would get angry because he needed that like mental stimulation. And, and he, so he wanted to start learning letters. He wanted to start da, 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 da. So he kind of bullied me into homeschooling him um, <laughs> in the beginning. And then honestly, we just kept going. And now we have, we've always homeschooled and slowly, but surely a thousand surely, different ways. Of a thousand different ways. Uh, my uh, yeah. um, confidence, my ability has just been increased. I've worked a lot on, my own personal education. So it's not just, you know, kid education. And it's been really this amazing growth journey for myself as well as with the kids. But, but we're also now valuing, I mean, every season is different with kids, right? And so we've done things at certain times because we felt like we needed more of this, done some things we felt like we needed more of this. And currently we're, we've been on this de-schooling phase um, working towards unschooling, which we're starting to see shifts and things because we really feel like I was spoon feeding them too much, um, planning too much so that they were not able to do so themselves because I am very type A, like this is our schedule from eight to eight fifteen, da 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 da. And you know, <laughs> like really, like I'm that mom. And I needed to really step away from that to allow myself to be more flexible and more intuitive, which is not natural for me. And so we're on this kind of more intuitive unschooling journey. Both of us are at this point yeah. in time. So which is fun for me because he's I having always, I wanted to I wanted to homeschool and I honestly I wanted to homeschool my children myself too. Like I wanted to be a, a part of that, but I was always I've always been working. A big part of that is like I wanted my kids to see the value in creating things themselves through entrepreneurship. And I always wanted to uh, foster that in my, in my children and find ways that they can enjoy creating in that way. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so that's a part of what uh, we're doing as well as like, we have this little worm farm on the side that we're, we're, we're trying to do together. And that's uh, not all of them want to do it. Uh, you know, so <laughs> some of them are, are doing their own thing over there, but they're looking and seeing how, how, how it's coming and whatnot. But and when we were in it. Utah, our kids started a na little neighborhood business, uh -huh. all four of them. Yeah. And our little guy was like, three or four and they were cleaning up people's dog poop in <laughs> oh, their yeah. yards and they were making money and then and I wasn't helping them like I would go and supervise you know I don't want anything getting in anyone's mouth or anything but <laughs> but uh and some of the neighbors you know they just love that the kids are doing it so they pay them way more than kids should be paid to pick up dog poop but still <laughs> and then we would break it down and we're talking about okay so this is your profit and you guys have to split this up depending on who wanted to work and they could choose if they wanted to work 
And they knew if one of the kids did not work, they got to split it three ways instead of four ways. So they made <laughs> extra money. You know, they learned so many things. This just this little tiny entrepreneurship thing. Yeah. That was really fun. Yeah. yeah it's so great. I, I remember um, my daughter at one point, she wanted to run a cafe. So we said, okay, let's do that. And so we cleaned out the carport at the top. And it's it's a nice because people could just kind of drive in and they could stop. So we set up some tents and some tables and chairs and she did all the cooking, all the menu planning, all the invitations, the notices that went out to everywhere, all the pricing structure. And then she worked out too. So she, I even taught her how to do the baristering thing so she could make coffees for people. <laughs> and she was seven, right? And so she set it up so that she could run this cafe and it was called the Owl's Den. Um, which I think is what's inspired me to have the owl as part of what we do in our brand. <laughs> so it's the owl's den, and uh, so when she, when she'd made made uh, some money, so she paid me back for the ingredients, and then what was left, she went 50 50 um, 50 percent of that left over to her, and then the other fifty percent she decided for for one of the cafes, for example, it would go to. Um, she was really passionate about endangered species and so she chose a species to donate to like a wilderness fund oh. and then another cafe wow. she picked something else to do and that and it would go to that and so it was really much about this you know profit for purpose so and mm -hmm. it was and I, like those kind of experiences are just so invaluable aren't they to to really like, like what you're saying your children now have this opportunity to know how to negotiate their way through different places and that it's not unfamiliar they don't not necessarily get anxious about that kind of thing the same thing if they land somewhere then they might have the skills they know to like oh, okay well I can actually sort of think through what might be needed here how I can be of service and how I can actually find a niche in this place and start to to, to fit and be part of this, you know, bioregional community. And I think those kind of skills are so valuable and particularly, like you said as well, thinking about those intentional businesses that are really about mm. bringing about the kind of change that we need in the world today. And mm -hmm. one of the things I haven't asked you yet is like how did you find about permaculture in the first instance? Like where did that even come from for you? Because <laughs> you said you you found it at some point, but where did you, which shelf did you find it on? <laughs> That, that's totally Emily. And, um, yeah. <laughs> so Josh always, when we first got married, Josh would tell me how, his parents had built their house and Josh really wanted to build a house. I'm like, oh, okay, fine. And, but we were newlyweds. Like we didn't, we were not rolling in the cash. And so I'm like, you know, looking at cheap ways to build houses, whatever. And I ran into earth bag building and I'm like, Josh, we were already sustainability we nerds. I know we yeah. were already like very conscious of our ways. We knew we wanted a cloth diaper. Da -da. You know, we were crunchy. I guess we were crunchy at the time. And but I found Earth Bag Building. I'm like, Josh, we have to build our house out of dirt. And so that was our our kind of gateway point was was natural building. And it's you know a sister to permaculture. So slowly but surely, we ran into other building topics and then we ran into permaculture and and really just started diving we got the big books we got you know tons of reading the pdc all of that stuff but that was that was the entry point <laughs> looking for a cheap way to build a house yeah. in utah uh -huh. yeah right <laughs> all cash we were trying to do everything all like, cash yeah. all cash uh, yeah. and i was like okay can we do this and it turns out it was really really difficult we yeah. tried to get things past building code we eventually that's what we we actually moved out of the the state to get uh, get. That's why we went to Montana. Code. That's why we went to Montana. We found <laughs> land, and while we were doing that, we were like, we we can't consciously buy this this much land and not do anything with it. Um, and so we were like, how do we turn this land into something useful? And as we were kind of discovering that, we we started discovering permaculture. Right. We found we found out about permaculture, but we started diving into it yeah. a lot when we we're like, we get we got this land. What do we do with this mm -hmm. land? Right. Um, and that mm -hmm. was that was a big part of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. What a wonderful story and what a wonderful adventure that you're on right now. I mean, ha have you got an idea of how long you plan to stay or is it just like until the next adventure emerges or? What's your what's your vision from here? This so this <laughs> year or next year, um, we're going to be getting a farm here, wow. um, and like really setting up here, um, which the farm is going to be the bioregional hub. So we'll you know permaculture redesign, 
hopefully lots of community involvement and community engagement because the conversation really isn't happening here. So it's going to definitely be a conversation point to help people see how things can be done. Not that everything that they're doing here is wrong because that is not true at all. That's not true at all. Um, but it's like, a, it's like almost everywhere, right? We all have good and bad. Going yeah. That's yeah. Uh, but yeah, so it's not just going to be our farm and that's not the intention that we're trying to build towards. It's, it's going to be somewhat of an eco village. We have a hard time with the eco village concept in, in our Western world. Uh, uh, it's really, really hard for, uh, Western world and Panama has very much been, uh, they've adopted the, the Western world, uh, in a lot of ways. And, it, um, so we're, we're not building that in that sense, um, like a eco village because there's too many people that would butt heads and would have to change their, their paradigm so much to be able to, to kind of do that. So we, we want to engage with the community at, at large, but we want entrepreneurs to come in and take ownership of that. So there's going to be multiple owners of, of the farm and multiple, uh, uh, type of people living and staying at any given time in that uh, scenario. That's our bioregional hub for entrepreneurs, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we're building it into. But, but it is, it is like an from... ecology of enterprises in a way, like where, you know, yeah. what's yeah. food for one becomes the, you know, sorry, the waste from one becomes the food for another type of enterprise thinking or? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Where it's also a place that uh, can host retreats and, and education places, uh, education place. Uh, and, and our main focus is, again, growing regenerative economies in every bioregion is, is our, our goal. And through more regenerative entrepreneurs, like duplicate the, the amount of regenerative entrepreneurs, which may, if we, if we do it right, uh, start to reduce the, 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 the types of, of entrepreneurs that we need in, in, this, in this world uh, towards different types of products and different services that, that we need and, and less of building widgets and more of, of creating design and designing, right? Uh, is is our hope. Yeah, so how do transfer. people find out about your your membership and your course and this future bioregional hub and your podcast? Where is the best place for us to, to link to? I, I'll put the links below, but just for anyone who's just listening and doesn't have a chance to see down below, what would you tell them? Where should they go? Seedsadow.com is our website, T-A-O. Yeah. That's our podcast. So you can also look us up as well through uh, any podcasts, Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google, whatever, right? Uh, you might start there and join us for, for a podcast episode. Uh, you might go to our, our website and check out our course uh, there. You can you can get involved there. We do a, a monthly think tank for entrepreneurs that's free. Um, and, and again, that's on the first Wednesday. So you can find that on our website as well. And there's lots of amazing resources that we have that are uh, available for any entrepreneur at any stage, wherever you're at. Uh, we try to be as, uh, as open as possible. Uh, obviously, our, our perspective has been in, in a Western world, so it's harder for people to do that online if, if, they're, if they're, uh, they don't have access to, to those types of tools. Uh, but we try to make, make it as uh, readily available as, as possible. Uh, in several different ways. Go to our website, essentially. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, it's been an absolute delight spending this last hour with you. Thank you so much for both joining me on, on the Sense Making the Changing World show. Um, it's really inspirational what you're doing and, and the story that you shared. And I just think your kids are the luckiest kids. You know? <laughs> Go on these <laughs> great big adventures and explore the world and be open to, you know, all these different possibilities. It's it's just wonderful. And and I really do encourage people to, to follow the links that you've just shared because really looking into how you can not just do this in your own home, but how you can share it out to the world and really help to myceliate this, you know, these positive messages and to and to bring change in the everyday. Um, these skills are absolutely essential. So thank you for focusing on them and to bringing this to the world of, of permaculture and regeneration. You know, I think it's just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you for having us, more. It was so fun. Well, thank you for tuning in to this episode of Sense Making in a Changing World. Check out the show notes below to find links to the resources mentioned in this episode. Also too, this is where you'll find details of all of our permaculture courses, our permaculture YouTube blog, and free masterclasses and permaculture film clubs. Make sure you signed up too to hear all of the news and updates. 
and come and join us at the Permaculture Education Institute to learn practical skills for designing and teaching permaculture and making a good livelihood while living a permaculture-inspired, one-planet way of life. Take care, everyone. See you soon.